Okay. Uh, hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we are really excited to have you on. In this webcast, we're going to be covering a really interesting topic. We're going to cover rich change controls for building workflows you can trust. My name is Joel. I lead a solutions architect team here at GitLab, and I'm joining you from Chicago today, where it's finally stopped snowing. We'd love to hear uh, where you're tuning in from, so feel free to use the chat function to say hi, tell us where you're from. Before we get started, just a couple real quick housekeeping items. Uh, first, feel free to qu ask questions throughout the presentation. You can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen for that. Also, we have dedicated time for questions at the end of the webcast. You can go ahead and send your questions anytime as you think of them, and we'll be sure to get to those at the end. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can also use the chat function to get in touch with me uh, for help. I'm the moderator. Our presenter today is Darwin Sanoy, a GitLab Senior Solutions Architect from Pennsylvania. Uh, we'll also launch a poll or two throughout the podcast or the webcast here so we can learn more about you. And uh, that way, Darwin can also tailor his presentation accordingly. So with that, I'm going to just launch our first poll to ask you as a user of GitLab, uh, what version of GitLab you might be using. Okay, and with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Darwin. Darwin. You say, uh, really excited to deliver this content to you today. Um, as a senior solutions architect at GitLab, it is my job, but also my pleasure to help customers understand how to adapt the many different uh, widgets in the GitLab toolbox to facilitate their Get DevOps uh, transformations and their DevOps uh, workflows. Um, so Git, GitLab has a lot of rich controls that you can apply, but it kind of tends to end up being like a, a box of Legos um, that's all mixed up. And I used to play with Legos as a kid, the, a big box of Legos. And sometimes you don't know all of what's available to you. So we're going to take you through and try to give you some information on exactly what's available to you. And then sometimes you don't know what you can make what's, with what's available to you. So we're also going to show you some patterns, what you might make with those controls. And some of these controls are used in a little bit different way because GitLab is a GitOps oriented system when it comes to supporting deployment. So with that, let's jump right in. We're going to go through a, a bit of an agenda here and see some of the things that we're going to cover. So first of all, we'll talk about custom user groups. And custom user groups are something that we can create inside of GitLab. You're familiar with seeing uh, users mixed into groups with repositories, but it is possible to create specific groups that are dedicated just to managing users and create them in a kind of structure that's very similar to operating system groups, which you may have had experience with. So we'll take a look at what you can do there. That's important because custom user groups can then be used in many of our gating controls. And our gating controls cover both code collaboration, so making sure your code is good, as well as deployment control. So making sure that things are being deployed to the right environments in a proper way. Um, so we have to use those gating controls for both of those types of activities when we're doing the full DevOps lifecycle inside of the tool. We'll then talk about repos and merge requests as workflow building blocks. So you may not be aware that there's several features that go over top of multiple repositories, which allow us to then use repositories as sort of a workflow building block. So we don't have to keep all of our workflow in a single repository, even though we may be using a code base to target uh, many environments. We'll also talk a little bit about enabling de facto development patterns. So if you're doing microservices or other patterns, you may wonder if these are possible and what some of the options are within uh, GitLab. And so we'll show you a few patterns that are possible. Once we give you the component tree, we'll show you some pre-assemblages of it, kind of like that picture in the back of the Legos box that shows you, hey, this is what it should look like when you're done. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, just basically reviewing a table of controls by their GitLab edition. So at what GitLab edition do they uh, become available? And then also their scope. So what do they affect? An entire repo, multiple repos, just a merge request, a single file in a repository. So give you that scope information. And then we'll also indicate where custom group support is available within those controls. 
So let's talk just a little bit about custom user groups because they're a fundamental part of what we'll be talking about. So the history of group structures in Git collaborative solutions is really that we only had one resource type repositories. So it really evolved that we, hey, we have some groups of repositories and we wanna group them together. And then we wanna assign users to be able to manage the repositories within that group or manage within the individual repository. And so that's kind of why the Git collaborative solutions all have this kind of effect where if you come from the operating system world, you're like, well, hey, where's the user groups? Why are they all mixed in with the resources? It's because there was really only one resource type to manage. So over time, GitLab has developed the capability to have the resource groups separated from user management groups. Uh, custom user groups can be used in many different places for gating controls. And so when we move to the next slide, you'll see the term custom user groups uh, used or custom groups, I think, uh, used throughout the slide. And that's how you know when these things can be used. Uh, we can also create a dedicated groups hierarchy just for users. So we separate our groups of users from our repositories and then assign them in users. And if you've been doing operating system groups, you know this is a best practice right off the bat. Don't assign users to individual resources. No, instead we wanna always assign them to groups. To what degree you adhere to that kind of operating system orientation or uh, directory group orientation will be up to you, but will at least give you the uh, enablement to be able to do that. So within a group, if you check in a group that you have a maintainer or higher permissions to, and you look into its settings, there'll be a subsection for permissions. And these two little permissions are kind of looking innocuous, like they don't do much, but they're actually quite powerful. So the first one, allowed to create groups, this is set to maintainers by default, and you can uh, up it, or I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, it's set by, to developers by default, and you can up it to maintainers or say no one can create groups. And as soon as you do that, you eliminate the risk that someone starts creating repositories in a structure that you consider for users only. The other control you have is allowed to create subgroups, and this is set to maintainers by default, and you can set it to owners and then make sure the only people that are owners in any of these groups are the people who are responsible for administering the group, the set of groups, and that can tailor that down so that no one's creating structures that you don't want. Also, you can delegate group membership management. So if you're like, hey, we got 50 teams here, I'm not interested in being constantly having tickets come in to add this user to that group. If you make a user a maintainer of one of these groups, then they can add and remove users from that group. So you can essentially delegate that membership management. In addition, it's important to keep in mind that the source group role has no bearing on new assignments. So if I have a group of 20 users and I've made um, five of them developers and one of them maintainer, and I reassign it to a new group and say, hey, over here, you're just a reporter. This group is a reporter inside of this repository. Well, then they only have reporter in that repository. So the original permissions they have in the original group do not sort of flow through to a new membership assignment or a new permission that we assign on any of the controls that you'll see that we talk about today. And finally, one of the things that's not so helpful is that group memberships uh, inside of Git collaborative systems flow down the hierarchy. So if you make someone a member of a group and it has three subgroups, they're automatically a member of those subgroups. And so one of the things you want to keep in mind is to not put people in those intermediary groups. It's actually best if you create your structure so there's no need to ever put someone in some sort of intermediary or higher up group that all memberships go in the lowest level groups. So if you were to create a structure yourself that's dedicated to users only, then it might look something like this if you've been around operating system groups for a while. You can see here, I've tried to help people understand with no users in this group, that's just the description of the group. And it's making, making a declaration both that no users should be added if you're an admin. And it's also making a declaration if you go to select this group somewhere that there's no users in it, so don't use it. Um, but that might be hard for people to remember because the description's not always displaying whenever we go to select the group. Um, so while this structure is tempting, uh, and it might be necessary, if you do so, you have to be sure that everyone understands you only ever assign users to the bottom level groups. And then you'll also need a, a kind of a, a group, like in the case of SREs here, you can see we have an all SREs group. So that's the one that actually contains all the SREs, not the group above it. And then any breakouts we have of uh, uh, individual SREs for different purposes, we would create subgroups underneath that group. Probably a better structure if you can handle it. So if you don't have 7,000 groups and it becomes really hard to, to manage is to have a flat structure. And here we can see that the naming convention kind of indicates a hierarchy. So we can see we do have QA groups and we have info security groups and they sort together because they're named similarly. 
Um, but in this case, we don't have to remember that we don't, can't add users to intermediary, intermediary groups because there aren't any. And so that's another way to handle this challenge. Take a look at the screen at both of them and they have a prod approvers group in various different areas. And what this is emphasizing is that when we deploy to an environment, we want to maybe have special users that are production approvers and only they can do production approvals. Now, if you have the premium or up level product, then you can do multiple people from different group sets. So you can say, I want one production approver from SREs, one production approvers from security and two production approvers from application A. Um, in the starter product, you can only specify one set of groups and users and roles, and then a total number of approvers for that. So you just have one approval rule. Um, so in that case, you'd probably want to have something like app A production approvers, and then add someone from security, add someone from, um, in, uh, from SREs and a, a few developers or the entire development team. Uh, that's a little bit more manual and you can't have the uh, delegated permissions, but at least you can still accomplish uh, somewhat like that, but of course, if you say I want four approvers and there's 20 people in there, someone could leave out someone from security. So premium gives you a lot more flexibility in controlling a bunch of rules for different user groups and, and how many approvals you need from each. So that's the concept of custom user groups. It's fairly uh, strong in GitLab. All you have to do is say, hey, we're going to create a structure that only contains users, then turn on these two settings and all of those groups and start controlling how uh, users are added to those groups and then use those groups whenever you're assigning permissions to your repository groups. We're going to shift gears now and talk a little bit about the gating controls that we have. Now because GitLab is a GitOps oriented product and supports the full DevOps lifecycle, it has these gating controls both for code review, which is something that you're familiar with. All code systems, uh, source control management systems have this kind of concept of let's collaborate and make better code changes and ensure that everybody's approved it and, and everything. But then also environment change control becomes a concern for deployment. So when we do a deployment, we also can use these same gating controls to control deployments. So we'll start with the, the initial and well-known model of using it for code integration. So we have our one code integration branch here, which is where we'd hope that all developers merge their feature branches before they go any further. And the first control set that we have is a, a push rule, a push rule and pre-commit hooks actually. And push rules are like a firewall for our repository. So they basically say, I don't ever, ever want to see this in my repository. And I don't want anyone to be allowed to commit it if they have it there. A great example is secrets. So committing some AWS keys into the repository is a problem. Now we could look for them in CI and say, hey, if you find any keys, flag it, fail the build. The problem is we may not have a build set up on that branch. Uh, or uh, we do find it and we do decide we're gonna fix it, but now in Git, in order to completely cleanse that secret forever, we have to go in and force rewrite history, which is a, usually a no-no for most organizations Git flow. So it's a very bad thing for those credentials to even hit the repository one time. So in push rules, we can say, this isn't gonna happen. Now, when you move up to the premium level, level you get two new uh, push rules that are available to you, and that's verified committers. So technically in Git, I can put some information in my local Git client that says I'm Joe Blow who works over in another company or another part of my company, and then make commits, and then I can push those to my repository, and it will look like someone else is responsible for those commits. Verified committers says if you're logged into GitLab and pushing a commit, that better be the identity that has been used in your commits or I'm going to block you. So it basically says, I wanna know that, only, that you're the one who's either, you either created this code or you're taking full responsibility for it. We don't wanna have any accidental or purposeful um, identification, uh, misidentifications of who made the code. Signed commits says that we're gonna sign the commits with code signing so that we know that that commit as you committed it has not been played with since it's been sitting in your local repo and before it got pushed into our master copy on the, on the server. So signed commits and verified committers together gives you a very high level of traceability of a code change right back to an individual. And this can be important for some organizations if they deal with a lot of contractors and they really wanna know what's been going on in terms of commits, uh, or if you work for any highly secure organization or government organization where it's really important to know where the code came from right down to the fingers that tapped it out. So this is a great set of features if you have any of those kind of needs. 
Another control, which is a uh, pre-commit hook, is locked files and directories. You can think of this as a person putting a semaphore on a file across the entire repo. They're basically saying, I'm going to be playing with this file. I don't want anyone else to be able to commit to any branch anywhere in the repo if it contains this file, because only one of us is supposed to play with it at a time. And so locked files and directories is a feature that allows you to do exactly that. Make sure that you and only you can change this file from the time you you put the lock on it until you release the lock. So now we start getting some feature builds and of course different developers are working on different features. They commit their features up to uh, Git, uh, GitLab and then we have the capability to start working with them with the CI CD uh, components of the system. One of the cool things with GitLab is for free you get enterprise capable production ready uh, full on CI and that capability is very um, uh, very strong. You can craft all kinds of different workflows that you might need. We demo certain ones and we have certain automatic ones, but really you can craft just about anything you need to with this. Within uh, GitLab CI, we also have something called a uh, manual uh, phase. So we can set up a job as when manual. And what that'll do is cause that job to pause and either a human has to come and press play on it, or we have to call an API to get it going again. And this can give us some gating of the process where it pauses the pipeline. And this is different than a container waiting in a polling state because if that container were to die or we start getting 5,000 containers in waiting states because they're waiting for something to happen for a week each, uh, that could be a big problem. So this kind of pause is really happening at the workflow level. Uh, so there's no container waiting around, just GitLab itself knows, hey, this uh, pipeline is on pause until someone uh, continues it. So that's really a decent gating control, but there's no, uh, assignment of users about it. Basically, people who are a uh, repo maintainer or if you open up developer can press that play button, um, but it's not assignable. So we know who pressed the play button necessarily and um, requires certain people review it before they press the play button. One of GitLab's great strengths is dynamic review environments. We do put a lot of emphasis on our Kubernetes support because it can be so full featured and security cordoned off from everything else. But we also support dynamic review environments with regular web servers. So if you deploy a web server and knit it together with your GitLab workflow, then it can deploy to a subfolder, have a subdomain published, and you can see that review app and play with it. So that opens up a whole rich world of doing review apps for things that are not containers and or not Kubernetes. One of the things that we'll just mention briefly is a security and compliance scanning and dashboard that you get with the ultimate package. Uh, this allows you to start seeing some problems at the repo level and later on we'll talk about at higher levels as well to understand what kind of security challenges your code bases are undergoing. And so today we're talking mostly about premium and moving from starter to premium, uh, but that's one feature we wanted to let you know about if you have a lot of security concerns. So when we go to merge a feature branch into our code integration branch is when we start to have some of our controls. And in GitLab, the single source of truth or the ultimate view of change management is the merge request. And in a merge request is where we start kicking in various features that allow you to be able to get a lot of controls. So in starter, we have merge approvals, which is simply the ability to say, I require at least X number of people to say they approve out of this set of users, groups, or um, roles within the repository. And you can set one number for one rule and it can include two users, a role of developer in the repository and three groups from another place, but it's just one set for the entire set of individuals that you identify. Then tag protections are also available. So a lot of people use tags to indicate very important things about code, like an official version number, or official release number. So we can also add tag protections with custom groups uh, with the starter version, and that will help us protect uh, tags from being uh, updated for the specific um, users. So users can't move a version tag unless they're in that group. Premium adds multiple approval rules. So I just mentioned that briefly before, if you want one from ISO, one from SRE, and three from the development team, and someone else to speak into this particular review, well, then you can specify them separately in those rules, and all the rules have to be met before the merge will be allowed to proceed. Now, a lot of our controls happen in merges, and there's more of them that we'll talk about in the tables that indicate the different uh, features that we have at the merge approval level. But those are some of the highlights and the premium uh, highlight. Then when we go into, uh, after we've done our code review and we go to push 
code, only certain people are allowed to merge the code and this is called branch protections. Um, so when only certain people are allowed to merge it, we can also specify custom groups in here. So we can say one custom group, only people in say production approvers or uh, final code review are allowed to merge to this branch. Then we can have even more control and that is a uh, starter feature. Then we can also have CI and off as many of these branches as we wish. So this is just showing you that, hey, the whole CI workflow that we talked about earlier is also available off of our integration branch. And of course, we can also flow back um, and figure out if that review, if this merge is gonna succeed or have a problem. Um, one of those premium features that we'll touch on later is that when you do this merge, um, you definitely can fail a build but maybe we wanna not allow the merge unless that build's gonna succeed. So how do we do a predictive build? So we have something called uh, builds for merges that does a separate build as if the code was merged before merging it. So just right on your uh, CI agent, it's gonna merge the code and run the build and be able to tell you whether that's gonna succeed or fail without actually merging the code, which is a really awesome feature. So you can then say builds have to succeed. And by the way, my merge commit build failed so I, without even merging it, I know that it's gonna fail. So that's really powerful for merge, uh, merge approvals. Then if we are, if this particular repo also supports deployments, oh, I'm sorry, I, gotta, I don't wanna skip over this over here. Um, we also have protected environment gating with premium. So when you deploy to an environment, you can say only these individuals can actually do that final stage of deploying to a given environment. It's similar to branch protections, but it's oriented around the target environment that you're pointed at. And so this is another way to start controlling who is exactly allowed to push to certain environments. Now, usually on an integration branch or especially feature branches, you don't care like feature branches, you want every developer who's building code to be able to push out to that environment because it's isolated and you want to see if it's working. But as we get further and closer towards production, you usually want this more and more constrained. So that's a premium feature as well. Now with GitOps, we're gonna start using branches now for deployment. So and you know that you use branches for code development, but even once code is done developing, we can start to use branches and merging to deploy it to production environments. And so in this case, we can have individual gates that have to do with those branches at the branch protection level. So our merge approvals, the big great gate uh, applies to every branch and then our branch protections can apply to individual branches. If you need something where you need merge approvals <clears throat> that are different by branch, well then we could separate it into different repositories and start to get that uh, particular granularity. <clears throat> so some of the things we have at the branch protections level for, for free, you have uh, branch protections by role. So you can say branch, only developers can merge to this or only maintainers can merge to this branch. Then in starter, we have users and custom groups can be specified. And finally in premium, code owners can be specified. Now code owners is something that's developed uh, within the Git community around having more control over specific files. So sometimes some files are so important or so specific that we want only certain users to be allowed to approve those changes to those files or groups of users. And so code owners, can be set up as a branch protection that if all, you know, amongst all the merge approvals that you gave, no code owner was specified or no code owner approved it for XYZ file, which has a code owner identified, then we're gonna block you. You have to get at least one merge approval from that individual. And that's also a premium feature. Um, also, uh, you can see that we can use custom groups in branch protections. Uh, so that you can also use custom groups for uh, code owners. So I'll just drop back one slide. So this is a lot of information, a lot of gating controls. So this is kind of like your pile of Legos and what all the different pieces and parts might do. Um, but because we unpacked it slowly, I'm hoping that you kind of get a concept of where some of these things can be used. We're now gonna use these ideas and try to block them together to help you understand some other features of the system. So if we have an entire repository workflow and we wanna start linking repositories together and also linking different uh, merge requests together, we can start to get some new functionality. One of the things we add in premium is an ops dashboard. So all these operating environments, you can check out what versions deployed there, how healthy are they, what was the last deployment. And so you can create that ops dashboard over all the operating environments in a repository. 
We also have something called merge trains. And merge trains are when multiple merge requests need to succeed as a group in order for us to continue, but we have no order dependencies. So we say, hey, these three merge requests need to complete successfully so that we can move forward. But we don't want to wait for each one because then someone's going to make another commit and the whole thing is going to start over again. We want to get through them as quickly as possible. And since we have no sequence dependencies, let's just run them in parallel. And that's basically what a merge train is. It lets you associate those together and it's within the context of a repository. So in this case, three merge requests in the same repository. We also may have multiple repositories. So if we start linking repositories together to get certain effects, and microservices is one example that we might do this for, um, then we can start using um, environment roll-up dashboards. And these allow the various environments across many projects to roll up in a group context. So we can start seeing what's going on across multiple environments. In addition, the security and compliance roll-up uh, rolls up as well, and it rolls up as many group levels as uh, you have. And then we can start using something called uh, merge request dependencies. And merge request dependencies can be within the same repository or across repositories. And what this basically lets us do is to start to link repositories. We're saying these merge requests depend on one another, but they're also sequentially dependent. So merge request one and repo one would have to complete successfully for merge request two in repository one to go ahead and then be capable of completing and so on. So all of these dependencies are sequential and have to wait for the build steps of the previous uh, merge to complete. So those are merge dependencies. And we have a little bit of more information about each one of these. So that's some of the ways we can start then using repositories and merge requests to be a workflow control across multiple repositories. So let's talk a little bit about some patterns. What we have here is a microservice pattern that is 12 factor compliant. And if you're familiar with 12 factor, it basically says that for each microservice, you're gonna have a repository. And when you have a repository for each one, you also be able to deploy independently or dependently. So you can say, hey, we updated two services and both need to be updated in order for this new functionality to work. Then you can link those together in this case with merge request dependencies. Or you can also have these deploying independently if your microservices are that uh, independent of one another. So a 12-factor microservice uh, capability, no problem. Um, also, you might have a situation, we have customers who are software companies and they have to deploy the same exact software to multiple stacks. Sometimes this is customer tenants. So every customer has their own kind of standup and they need to be able to vary the version by customer or only update the customer when the customer's ready. So this is showing three repositories, each generating artifacts, and then those artifacts being reused in deployment only repositories. And so we can have those merge controls available in order to push that code out. Um, a lot of times this has to do with individual customer config. So the, all that would be in the de environment deployment repositories would be anything that's specific to a customer. And if it's been boiled down to be just config files, then those merges would allow this to proceed and you can have the additional merge controls. Another possible scenario is having um, repos as building blocks for CD push only. So a lot of people are familiar with products that only do uh, CD and they are very sophisticated around just getting code artifacts out. And this is another thing that can be done in GitLab as well. So as you've seen this flow, we know that at the end of the day on our production line at the bottom, we can go ahead and push to an environment. But what you may not know is we could also push with some different tags and target a different environment, maybe with a different version. And so we don't really have any kind of limitation on how many times we do a deploy once we do a build. So in this way, we can have uh, one, you know, a more uh, an, a situation where we have a lot of target environments for the same exact build. What we do potentially lose here is our merge request uh, capabilities. So at this point, we only really have protected environments capabilities. So list of, list of users or a group of users that are able to approve this push, and that's the only control we have. So if you need more collaboration, you'd want to drive this back to a merge request in order to enable it. But we can do this uh, model as well. So let's take a look. So that's kind of some patterns as well as some of the capabilities. 
I want to go through now uh, kind of a table view of the control scope, whether we have group capability and what addition each of these uh, capabilities comes into. Um, so on the screen here, we've covered most of this already. One that we haven't covered is resetting approvals when code is pushed. So you can go ahead and say, hey, if someone pushes a new commit, reset all the approvals. Everybody's got to approve again. High impact, but it might be necessary depending on your situation. You can say pipelines must succeed. And this is where we can also link this with the premium feature of pre-merge pipelines. So the pre-merge pipeline must succeed in order for us to approve a merge request. All review discussions must be resolved is where we say, hey, if someone's started some concerns, when you comment your code in review in a merge uh, request, you can either create it as a comment, which is basically, hey, here's some info, or you can hit start review. And when you do that process, you're basically saying, I don't want you to ignore my input. I want you to work through it and then we'll hit resolve discussion when everybody's happy. And so that is supported with core as well. Um, finally, preventing merge, preventing anyone who either authored the merge request or authored any of the code from being a, an approver. So you're basically saying, hey, if you're the ones promoting this change or trying to get it through, we're gonna just say that it has to be completely other people that approve it. So we get a lot of eyes reviewing it. We don't have, basically the curse of expertise. If you've been working on a bit of code for uh, a week straight, guess what? You're not the best person to review it because if there's some mistakes in it, you've already looked at the mistakes a thousand times and we'll probably let them through. Um, so those are some of the new bits and that's in Core and Starter. In Premium, we have a lot of other things that we add and some of the, most of these we've discussed. Um, one that we haven't discussed is merge request reviews. So I don't know if you've had this experience, but I've gone in, made a comment on someone's code and said, hey, you really ought to consider X, Y, Z. Go four lines down in the diff and see there's where they considered X, Y, Z. So guess who looks dumb and has to erase the comment or say, oh, I see it's already handled. Meanwhile, everyone's gotten an email saying that you have a code concern. So merge request reviews allow you to bulk edit all of your comments at once and then publish them all at once so that you can make sure they're consistent within themselves. Um, so that's a really helpful feature. Uh, and I think we talked about uh, everything else on this slide. Oh, I guess uh, overriding merge request approvals. So normally merge request approvals, you set them in the repository and every merge request created in that repository must comply. And it's a point of policy. If it doesn't comply, it doesn't work. However, if you change this setting, you're basically saying, these are actually the suggested configuration. I trust the person who's allowed to make merge requests to make alterations and say, you know what, we're updating documentation. I don't think anyone from security would really want to spend the time to approve that. So you can knock off the approvers for security for docs only changes would be an example. And then finally, some more premium features. Uh, we didn't cover this in the uh, graphics that we went through, but audit is a big emphasis in premium. So you can create audit users and it's a new class of user. We have users and admins. And then when you have uh, premium, you have a class called audit. And when you use that, those users have read access to everything in your instance or group structure. And what that allows them to do is to do their job of auditing code or maybe security, security audits without having to be added to every repository in the system. Uh, we also have audit events that are in the GUI. So you can see when people change things. So if someone's a maintainer and they go change a group so that, that uh, they go change a setting so that they can add a subgroup, then add the subgroup and then change the setting back so that it doesn't look like they have the setting, you're gonna have an audit event and be able to understand that that happened. I also didn't mention that in all merge requests, you have audit events automatically added to the log all the time. So people check a checkbox in a, uh, markdown checkbox, it's in the body of the merge request, it records that and you can see who checked it or unchecked it and when. Uh, so there's audit capability built right at that level as well. Uh, we also have additional audit events that are available through the API and you get those with premium. And then just dropping down, we covered protected environments, all of those, and then security approvals and license compliance approvals. Basically, if you can set the whole instance so that if someone is uh, accepting code, so developers are allowed to say ignore this vulnerability, but if they do that on a vulnerability that has not been reviewed by security before, then we can require that security must do an approval. We can do the same if they accept a blacklisted license. So the license has been blacklisted, someone decides, you know what, I'm just going to slip this one through. All of a sudden, security has to be able to review that. So that's the kind of the view of all the little features and functions and some of the places where you can use them, the inflection points where you can use them in your workflow to start to take some control um, over these uh, various aspects. 
So what we've gone through is custom user groups that it's a very real and strong concept within GitLab. You just have to know a few little secrets about creating uh, groups that are dedicated and setting a couple settings. Those gating controls are used for both code collaboration and deployment control. And in many places, the custom user groups can be used to do that. Also re repositories and merge requests can also be used as workflow building blocks. So using them above a set of repositories where the repositories are actually components of your workflow rather than kind of the top level concept of your workflow. We also enable de facto development patterns such as microservices. Um, Monorepo is one that we'll be covering in a future session next week actually. So you might wanna pick that up if you use Monorepo instead of the 12 factor type model. Also controls by addition and control scope and custom group support. So if you're one of the kind of workflow architects, uh, you usually wanna know what are all the pieces, what context or scope do they apply to, and can I use very interesting things like custom user groups in them? So that's what that table is all about is helping you work your way through that. So I hope that that's given you a good overview of the richness that's available and some of the ways we can assemble that componentry to uh, suit your workflows. And I'd just like to open it now up to any questions. Okay, thanks Darwin. And if you have uh, any questions that you wanna enter at this time, you may. There's only one current question and that basically Darwin was around the code review function. So if you um, could share kind of what that looks like, we talked a lot about merge requests and things, but there's kind of a, a generic question on code review. If you have okay, sure. Sure, let me um, see if I can find a suitable sample. All right, here's something. Um, this is a merge request that's in process. So it's a work in progress. So this is gonna block that it moves forward. But as we look at the single source of truth for change management, we can start to get a view of what's going on. So this particular pipeline passed, uh, all of our phases passed. And if we wanted to, we can dig into the individual uh, logs uh, and find out exactly um, what happened right down to the level of every detail uh, within that particular build step. This particular build also for a branch built us a review app. So we can open up and see exactly what the app looks like at this level. This is obviously a very simple app, um, but if you had some changes that you wanted to visibly verify, you could do so or functionality changes. In addition, we can see uh, who our approvals are required from. In this case, we just have um, one group, uh, but we could have multiple groups here. We can view the eligible approvers, find out who has approved. We also have uh, roll-ups of any security scanning and license scanning that happened within this workflow. So in the phases here, we have multiple um, security uh, possibilities of what might be tested. We can have a bunch of SAS checks for various uh, vulnerabilities in your source code. And then if you're using review environments, we can also check for vulnerabilities in your compiled finished application from the front end. And so those all roll up into the uh, security panel And so here we can see all the various vulnerabilities that were found. Uh, we can take action on those uh, various vulnerabilities. We also um, have the capability to break it down by report type. So all security scanning comes up as some people, sometimes people ask this question, they're like, okay, you did all that scanning, but now I only have one security panel. Where's the security for individual parts? Well, you can go ahead and break it down that way, but because all vulnerabilities are reported very similarly, we assume you just wanna see the top level view, but you can start to dig into which is which. Um, we also have the licenses panel, which was linked from the initial uh, merge request. And this allows you to see what licenses are in play and which ones might be blacklisted, which ones might be new since the last time the code was compiled. And so that license panel is available right here. So you could click through from there. We have a merge conflict. So we know we have to resolve that before moving forward. And down here is where you can see what kind of things were going on. So this is an audit log for the merge request. And you can see what kind of actions were taken. Interestingly, if we had some check boxes, this only says closes 137, but if we had a checklist in here, as people check the items off, it also appears down here. So we, it's another way to add kind of some approval capabilities or at least a checklist that must be getting done and you don't really care who does each step. And finally down here, we see a merge or a review. So someone's saying, hey, 
uh, here's some, I have some concerns about this code and we need to uh, make sure that they get resolved. So if there was an ongoing discussion and some code got changed or got justified why it's the way it is, then the person who started the thread could hit resolve thread and that would stop blocking our merge request. So all of these controls kind of come together here and we can block merge based on all the different uh, triggers and capabilities that we discussed in our session. All right, excellent. Um, we don't have any additional questions at this point in time. So I'd like to just say, you know, thank you Darwin for a very informative session. Thanks to everybody who attended for, for joining us. Uh, we are actually doing a second um, webcast coming up next week, and that will be on the, uh, the use of CICD for uh, more robust pipelines, more pipeline visibility, and some more complex use scenarios. And so uh, feel free to join us then. And if you're interested in learning other things further about GitLab Premium, you can join us uh, and, and ping us using the link as you see here on the screen. With that, thanks for joining us. We'll be sending over the recording from this webcast in the next few days, so keep an eye out for it and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.